let's go. This says preview. Am I live? I don't know. We shall find out. Hello, people, if everybody's out there. It looks like we're live. Oh, that's fantastic. OK. Hi. <laughs> I'm Tamitha Scove, and this is a brand new, whoops, hang on a second. This is strange. Oh, OK, I see. You're seeing my stuff. My apologies. I am looking at like three different feeds because of the way the whole, the, this whole uh, uh, streaming thing works now. Thing Whoops, works. now I've got to turn this off. Whoops. Okay, because I'm hearing audio from all different places and it's very strange. I've got a stream that, I've got the camera, my, this is my production camera and I'm so excited to be able to use it. And uh, so this is the, the camera that I usually use when I'm doing my forecast videos the, on the big green screen. So I'm very excited to be able to use it. Uh, I'm staring at a feed down here, which I don't know if I can show you. I'll actually pull it up here. This is my live um, feed to, there, I think you can see it. Uh, it's my live feed that actually goes to a sling studio. And it's now, I've got only one camera on right now, but I can actually have up to four. So as I get smarter about using this system, I'll be able to do more for you guys. And it's very exciting to me. Um, but there is a two second delay. And yes, audio can come from this, and it can get me very confused because I hear my, my normal audio, and then I hear this audio, and it's like, OK, uh, you know, they have an echo. And then, let me put this down so I can still monitor and make sure everything is good. <laughs> then I check the feed that comes off of YouTube, and that's like a 7 to 10 second delay, and that's what you're seeing on the screen here. <laughs> so if I seem just a little bit overwhelmed by all of this, please um, forgive me because I'm trying to monitor the the chat, you know, and, and, and the questions that come in the chat, but I'm also trying to, to make sure that I keep focused on giving you the best presentation I can. So I'm very excited with this new stuff, and uh, forgive me if we have a few hiccups here and there, because I'm sure we will. Uh, and uh, actually, I want to keep that up just behind. Um, because I'm going to show you something in a minute. And, and uh, you know, just bear with me as I get better and better at, at this kind of presentation uh, using this new gear of mine. And I'm extremely excited <clears throat> to say uh, thank you very much to all the patrons, especially at the mini tier level or the mini course level, who have helped make these possible. Um, oh my goodness, I have it on here too, so let me turn this off. <laughs> we don't need it down here. Um, I don't even know which it is. OK. So let me kill that so that we don't have too much stuff going on there. Um, but I'm very grateful to say uh, to the mini tier uh, or mini course uh, patrons, thank you so much for making this possible. Thank you so much for helping fund this new gear I have uh, that I can just now t I can take with me to, to various locations and, um, you know, and, and possibly do a much better job on the road than I ever have before. I am so grateful to you guys. Um, you know, it, it just enables me to do so much more for you, and my mind is still kind of expanding on all of the possibilities. So, uh, you know, stay tuned because we're definitely going to going to have some fun with this stuff. At any rate, um, here is a new course. Um, this is a small mini course today. We're going to be talking about solar activity cycles, and uh, I've got a, a, a few other glitches. You'll see. I'll have to move back and forth because a couple of my movies are not working on this Mac computer. Unfortunately, I, I do Windows to PC all the time, so it becomes an issue. Uh, so, you know, bear with me as I switch things around. But what, you're, what the, the main uh, gist of this particular mini course today is about is the, the solar activity cycle and how it affects space weather. Um, and not just spa space weather from the point of view of, you know, long term changes and stuff like this, but what we really can expect to see at different times during the solar cycle. Uh, because there really are some changes, and I'll, and, and I'll bet that some of you might actually be very surprised. Uh, we don't always have, you know, and I'm not going to go into a bunch of sunspot details and stuff like that. I can do that later. I've kind of left this to some of the more general aspects of space weather and the things that affect Earth. So if you're an astronomer and you really wanted me to go over to sunspots and talk about how they change and the butterfly diagram and all of that kind of stuff, 
I'll have to save that for another talk because right now I really wanted to focus more on the types of space weather that come from the changing activity cycle and a little bit about why uh, we don't always know what the activity cycle is doing and how long it's going to be, um, you know, where solar minimum is because I've gotten a lot of questions about solar minimum and why don't the, so the solar scientists know when solar minimum is going to hit, why does, why does it always seem that solar minimum, that we find out when solar minimum was <laughs> after the fact. And it's because these cycles are extremely variable. Um, even though they're 11-year cycles, they really aren't. And the, some people will kill me when I say the, the phrase pseudo-cycle. But they're really, there's a reason why we use those names pseudo-cycles, because there's so many other processes that are going on that make, that modulate all of these cycles that make it very difficult to say that it's got a straight periodicity. And, uh, and I'll go into that just a little bit. So let me, uh, <clears throat> let me talk about first a little bit about the solar phenomena, just that you can basically talk about an, a quiet sun. I don't know if you guys can read the text here, but you can see quiet sun up here. Um, we basically have the solar wind when we talk about the quiet sun. There's not a lot going on. Uh, we have uh, high-speed streams that come from coronal holes, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. And we also have interplanetary shock waves, and that comes from a slow stream and a fast stream interacting uh, as they move out in the heliosphere, out, move out toward Earth. But we'll, we will talk about that, and we'll talk a little bit about how the interactions occur. And then for an active sun, this is where things get very interesting. You have solar flares. Uh, and, and you have what we call coronal mass ejections, and these are what we call solar storms. Now, solar flares do lots of stuff. They release x-rays and radio bursts. Radio bursts, and uh, it, it, this is where we get radio blackouts from. Uh, these we are many different types of radio bursts, and I won't go into the details there, but they can span literally from very low frequencies uh, down in the low megahertz range all the way up to the gigahertz range. And this is why I'm always harping on when we have big solar flares, I'm always worried about things like, um, uh, you know, satellite radio. I'm worried about not just ham radio, not just short wave, but we start worrying about frequencies that get higher and higher. So you worry about satellite phones, uh, satellite transmissions, you worry about um, even GPS. Uh, with, with solar flares, that happens quite a bit because these are in the low gigahertz range, 1.4, 1.5, 1.6, 1.7 even. And these certain radio bursts actually get up to the, that high, if not higher. Um, well, I don't think we even really know how high some of these radio bursts get because I'm not sure. How, I mean, I, I, know, I know that there have been some uh, observations of this kind of thing, but... Uh, the frequency ranges that they can that they that the radio that the sun puts out in these radio bursts can be extremely high, so it's not that it's ex damaging necessarily the satellite communications. It's just blocking it because it's making so much more noise in that frequency range than the satellite itself when it's trying to transmit that you just it just drowns it out. And I, I know a lot of people have heard me talk about the cricket and the railroad tracks and the train. If you have a cricket near a set of railroad tracks, you can hear the cricket just fine, as long as a train doesn't go by. But as soon as a train goes by, all you can hear is the sound of that locomotive. You can't hear the cricket anymore. It doesn't mean the cricket stopped chirping. The cricket most likely still is. But you just can't hear it until the train goes by and it gets quiet again, and then you can hear the cricket. So that's exactly what it is with these satellites. The satellites are the cricket, and the sun, of course, is the train. And uh, we just basically have to deal with it. And there's really not much else we can do. Luckily, these radio bursts only happen on the sun's day side. Uh, so, so if you're on the night side, at least you get a chance for communication because the Earth itself blocks out the sun. You can't really hear or, you know, you don't really get the interference from the radio waves. It's just like radio waves are just like visible light waves. So if you can't see the light from the sun, you can't get radio bursts. So that's one positive thing. All right, so that's part of what solar flares do. They also give uh, solar energetic particle storms. I often call them radiation storms. Uh, and now all this stuff in solar flares, they, it travels essentially really close to the speed of light. Of course, radio bursts, you know, radio waves do travel at the speed of light. And the protons and electrons are what we call relativistic. So they travel very fast, too. Um, they don't necessarily take eight minutes to reach Earth, typically about an hour, maybe a little bit more. Uh, electrons often get, get here faster than... Uh, than protons do. 
but uh, the radiation storms happen very, very quickly after you have a solar flare. Uh, and then they continue to build because those, those radiation storms typically are fed. If there happens to be a coronal mass ejection, a big solar storm that's launched afterwards, you get um, the, the, the radiation storm is actually fed by a big shock wave in front of that, of that, uh, that solar storm. So CMEs, these solar storms, as be I begin to talk about, they are also part of the active sun. And there's a massive amount of plasma that's being, a massive amount of material that's being thrown off of the sun. And it drives really sh strong shock waves in space, but be because there's so much material. But they travel very slowly. And slow is, well, 1,500 kilometers a second isn't really slow by our stretch. Uh, but it does take longer than light, and it takes about anywhere between two to five days on average for these structures to hit Earth. Uh, and they can cause what we call geomagnetic storms. These are the storms that we get at Earth that cause aurora. Solar flares do not cause aurora. Coronal mass ejections or solar storms do. And they are not the same thing, although they do often happen together. And that's part of what makes this stuff very complicated and why people think that all of this stuff happens when the sun is very active, and then it doesn't happen at all when the sun goes quiet. Now what I'll do here, let me pop out of this for a moment so I can show you. So here's a solar flare. Just in case anyone forgot what a solar flare looks like. This, I think, was an X2 class flare, so hopefully you can see that. Let me play it again. And you can see the, the light, that the, the little gratings here is a diffraction. Um, just because of the, the way the instrument is, has been built, it's got a filter on the front, uh, and oftentimes you, get, you can actually see the diffraction grating from the filter when the, when the light is that intense, especially at this wavelength. But you can see it, boom, it's very fast, and that's where radio waves are released, and that's where you get a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of radio noise, a lot of light um, emission. And then, I wish I had my picture I wish I had this movie working. I don't because it's, but I'll, I'll, I'll be sure to find it at some other time. That was nice. I'll find it at some other time and play it for you guys. But right now, I'll just go ahead and play this coronal mass ejection. So you can see that right there. This is a coronal mass ejection. Let me run it back a little bit. Let's see if I can stop it. So this, as you can see, is a lot more material. It doesn't really look all that much like a flare, although it's hot and you do get a flare typically with it. Uh, especially the big ones, but look at all this junk that's being launched off, okay? So this is, a, this is what we call a coronal mass ejection. I will typically call it a solar storm, um, and um, simply because it's a little bit easier to remember than coronal mass ejection. I'm not going to make, you know, people don't need to necessarily know the lingo in order to understand what they're seeing. But when these things are shot earthward, these are the things that give us aurora, right? But they take, as you can see with all that material, it takes a lot longer for them to reach Earth than, let's say, a solar flare. So that's what we're dealing with there. And both of those things happen during the, um, during the, the, the active sun. But during the, a quiet sun, let me go back to this now. OK, hold on. And I won't go into this because the movies don't work again. But during a quiet sun, we're, we get a lot of other um, we get mostly sol solar wind or slow solar wind. And I'll talk about that more in just a minute. I kind of wanted to just take a second to really go through the solar activity cycle for, for those who have not really ever looked at it or thought about it all that much. Right now, we are in what is called the solar minimum. And you don't really see it here. I mean, this is a long, a long um, well, yeah, you do. You'll, you'll see it if I go one more. We're kind of in a solar minimum. We're getting down to a solar minimum here. Hopefully, you can see that. Yeah, OK. Um, and, and we have these cycles, if I go back, we have these cycles that go up and down and up and down and up and down. This is the Leffenier cycle. Uh, it's a, I will call it a pseudo cycle, although it is very well defined. I, I, and I'll always mispronounce it, the Schwabe cycle. Uh, and it's been known as having an average of about 11 years, but it can be as short as 9 years. And it can be as long as 14. We've, we've seen it stretch out quite a bit. And one of the biggest stretches that it did was this previous cycle, not the one we're in now, but the previous one, where the solar minimum just dragged out and dragged out and dragged out. And I'll talk about how that affected space weather pretty dramatically. And it's still affecting it, believe it or not, this, this, um, because we're entering a period of low activity, it seems. And 
you can actually see a little bit of that when I talk about this. You've got, um, this is from 1600 AD to 2000, so it's 2100 essentially. We're getting close to, you know, obviously what are, what, what is it this year, 2018. So this probably goes to about, I think, uh, this was the end of that other cycle. So this is, this is, I think, the end of cycle 23. It may not even be the end of cycle 24. Um, and this plot goes, you can actually see how you've got some red uh, X's here. This is ice core data. And this is when we actually started counting sunspot numbers uh, via amateur telescopes that obviously got better and better and better. And you can then this black line is an average over, you know, 1600 to, to 2000, how it goes, how, how the sunspot, essentially the proxy of the sunspot number, you can see the number here, uh, how much it varies. Now, everybody talks about the grand minimum, and the scary thing is when you talk about a maunder minimum. For those of you who do not know what a maunder minimum is, we've only had one <laughs> that we know of. And, and there's actually, there, I'll talk about some other minimums that we have. But this is the one that everybody remembers because we actually have some decent data and we have a lot of historical records where people remember the River Thames froze and they remember, and that actually happened again, that happened in the Dalton minimum as well. But they remember um, at that time that the sunspots went basically to zero. And the funny thing was, at that time, the people who lived there, they actually started thinking that sunspots were actually a myth because they hadn't seen any in over like something like 78 years. So there was an entire generation of people who thought that there was no such thing as sunspots and people had made them up because they lived their entire lives without ever seeing one. Uh, so I've always found that to be a very interesting period during the Maunder Minimum. Now, why did the sunspots disappear? Well, there's a lot of theory about that. Um, they have to do with some of these pseudo cycles that I'll, I'll get into here in a little bit more intensely in a moment. Um, but what, uh, I just lost my train of thought, but what really happened, if you really look at the details of it, it's basically that the magnetic field, to make it simple, the magnetic field of the sun diminished. Now, there's a lot of competing processes inside what we call the solar dynamo that we don't totally understand. And no, it's not like the Earth's dynamo or any other planetary dynamo. Uh, the sun's dynamo is very unique, and it doesn't even happen in the core. We think it's actually generated in, different, in a totally different layer further outside of the core. But there's still a lot of argument about that, um, and a lot, of other, a lot of models that try to talk about how, how it's created. But when you have some competing processes, then you can actually have kind of destructive interference. And without getting into too much detail, what ends up happening is that you can actually get the, the magnetic field strength of the sun to diminish and the brightness to diminish. They're actually connected. And what actually happened here is that the field, the strength of the sun became so low, especially where, where the sun would actually take these magnetic ropes from inside itself and try to pop them through the surface. These ropes became so weak that they couldn't pop through the sun's surface anymore. And so sunspots disappeared. And yes, we have models that go into that. And for those of you, I will, I will go back over a lot of the chat uh, after this video is done, and I'll see what kind of questions you guys have posed. And if people want me to go into detail about that aspect of solar physics, I will. But I'm not going to do it for this particular class. Um, at any rate, so, that, so for a very long period of time, the sun's magnetic field was extremely weak. And because of that, no sunspots were able to kind of pierce the surface and rise above the surface of the sun to be able to be seen as sunspots. Now, I'm not really sure exactly how much activity, solar activity, we had. Obviously, it would be diminished, but I doubt it went away entirely, and that's because of coronal holes. And that most, and that we'll talk about that as well uh, a little bit further on. But at any rate, so this is one of the big minimums that we had, and everybody's worried that we're going back to that. Now, that may or may not be the case. There's a lot of models that argue whether that's going to happen. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the observations that kind of make you wonder, maybe, maybe not. But at any rate, when we started looking at sunspots, uh, and, and, and that's where the blue data starts, we started, you know, we, here's the, the, the we, you can see that they kind of picked up, and this is, again, this is data from ice cores. But then you, and there's a, all sorts of ways of, of looking at this data. Um, you've got, and I'll, and I'll show you some more. You've got total solar irradiance through carbon dating. You've got um, things in, in rocks and ice cores, like I said here. There's, there's half a dozen, there's spectral lines you can look at. There's all sorts of, there's tree rings. 
I mean, I can, I can just start rattling off all these different ways that we try to get information about the solar activity cycles before we had direct observations with, with telescopes. Um, at any rate, so as we look at this uh, solar activity cycle and we see these, these ups and downs of the 11, uh, pseudo 11 year cycle, you can see the peak in these cycles really varies. And you can see that through the smoothed sunspot number that we've got right here. Um, there's definitely cur you know, uh, rises and falls. And the Dalton minimum is probably one of the famous, the most famous of the short uh, minimums. This is, again, we had a lot of historical information. This is when there were people who died in, in the UK because um, they had some of the coldest winters they've ever had on record. Uh, and, and also, uh, shortly after we came out of this Dalton minimum, is when one of the biggest events, if not the largest event we've ever experienced, at least in the modern age, uh, the Carrington event. So we actually had just come out of the Dalton minimum, and bam, we end up, we end up getting in 1859, getting hit by a Carrington event during a cycle that really wasn't all that big. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. But as you can see, you have the rise and fall here of the 11-year cycles. Obviously, solar maximum, solar minimum is when the sunspots basically go to zero. But there is some modulation as well on top of that. So what causes that other modulation? Now, and that's what we're going to go into for a second. Um, now, here's a, a nice example of, of how radically different the sun looks. This, these are images, I believe, from Yoko. Um, so these are, these are x-ray images. And this is 1996 when it was solar minimum. There's 97. These are one year apart. 98, 99, 2000. 2001 when we were at solar maximum, you can see all the bright regions. That's because of all the sunspots. Very different from the quiet sun, don't you think? And then as we go to past solar maximum to 2002, 2003, 4, 5, and back to solar minimum, this was 2006. This is when we started entering that very, very deep minimum. So you can see during solar maximum and in this area here, we are very much dominated by active regions. So that means flares. That means coronal mass ejections. That means big solar storms from uh, things that are being launched from the sun that are very obvious. But when we get down into these regions and these areas down in here, there's not a lot of sunspots that are happening. So that means that we're not going to be seeing a lot of those things. And yet, if you if any, if you pay attention to space weather, you realize that, geez, we still are getting quite a few storms, right? Where are the solar storms coming from if they're not coming from big flares and, and big coronal mass ejections, big, big solar storms like this? Where are they coming from that give us, that are still giving us aurora? And the trick there is cr from coronal holes. And we'll get to that in a second. Now, let's see if I've talked pretty much about all of this stuff. I kind of threw these charts in just to kind of, um, Make sure we we uh, we un uh, that that I kept I kept track of. There's one thing I wanted to tell talk to you about. The reason why I put this chart in here was that that with the pseudo cycles that I'm going to go into and some of the other um, longer activity cycles, I want I want to make sure that you guys understand that th having these types of cycles makes it very difficult for us to gauge what the 11 year cycle is. This this short cycle that everybody calls the solar cycle. Um, and that I just showed you there uh, on the last page with the, with the sun getting bright and then dim. That's one 11-year cycle or pseudo 11-year cycle. And here's an example of data that goes um, from 1995 to 2005. I believe this is solar cycle number, uh, cycle 20, 22 um, or 23 rather. And then this was a prediction that we made back in 2012 or that we made a prediction back in t September 20, 2008 about solar cycle 24. We thought that it was going to max, uh, get its solar maximum at 2012, and we thought it was going to be um, anywhere between 100 to 150 for sunspot number. And then in July of 2009, when we got a little bit more data in, and we saw this minimum getting worse and worse and worse, and not fi you know, finishing, it was just kind of stalling, it caused solar physicists to, to say, OK, well, let's revise our, our predictions. And now we're going to, in 2009, let's say the solar minimum is, or solar maximum is going to be 2013, and it's now average going to be a, about 75 uh, or so. It's definitely not going to be as tall as what we thought it was. Here's where they thought the normal was going to be, was up here. And in actuality, they, they've now decided that they're going to push the maximum out for a year, and they're going to drop the total sunspot number by quite a bit. And then in April 2011, when we got even more data, we decided, 
no, okay, it's not even going to be like that. It's gonna, the maximum is going to happen in 2013 and a half, and it's only going to be, now we're talking at, you know, 50 or 60 sun, sunspots for the maximum. So you can see we rapidly changed our predictions as solar physicists over the course of time because just we were seeing some ma massive changes. And the reason why we can get caught, so caught off guard is because during, the, the, during what we call the, 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 sun, um, the space age, which let me go back here, is essentially this period, right? We flew Sputnik in what, almost 1950-ish. Um, and, and this is really all we've had in terms of having modern instrumentation and, and modern ways of looking at the sun and really digging down into it. Compared to the number of cycles that you see and then this crazy, you know, modulation that obviously has a lot more to the pattern than we've just seen in this tiny little segment right here, you know, how in the world do you expect solar physicists to understand anything about all of this if this is really all the data they can trust, right? So that's part of the problem is that the time scale of the sun is so dramatically slow to any of our technologies and our understanding and even our human generation that it becomes very, very difficult for us to be able to put all this data together. I mean, we even have to kind of piece together ice cores or total solar irradiance or, you know, this proxy or that proxy because we don't even have a single data set of the same stuff that we can use to try to understand and make models with. Right, especially for the long-term variability, which I'll get into in just a moment. So in actuality, what really ended up happening <laughs> after this prediction that we made, what really ended up happening is that we had um, the, the solar maximum was about 2014 and a half, and, and it actually got a little bit higher than what our last prediction. It was probably closer to the, to the, 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 um, the number of sunspots that we made that we suggested in 2009. But it, again, it looked very different than what we're used to. It also had a different type of, of, of dual peak maxima. Typically, when we have the dual peak, it's usually the first peak that's bigger. In this case, it was a second peak that was larger. And that doesn't happen all that often. So we only have a certain number of, of uh, cycles that actually even have anything that was remotely like this. So we knew that this was very exciting. And, and it was going to, to wreak havoc with, um, with what we were you know, with, with trying to pr make these predictions. And again, I'll, I'll get into, we're going to get into that here in just a moment. But I just want to remind you that you have solar flares, and I'm sorry I don't have it on, a, on the movie where it shows the, the actual solar flare happening. So you have solar flares and solar storms, or CMEs, that are the, um, the more active sun. This is what we see during the active sun. And oftentimes you'll get solar radiation storms from both of these. So these types of things are what dominate during solar maximum, okay? As you get down to closer to solar minimum, though, and on the, also on the rising phase of the solar cycle, you get more of this type of stuff. There's not a lot. You see a few active regions up here, but look at this huge coronal hole. See that? Hopefully that comes out. Yeah, I can tell on the camera it looks fine. So this is where a lot of fast wind comes from, and this is what dominates as we get closer and closer to the, to the solar minimum. And I'll try to explain a little bit of that without getting too complicated here in a minute. But most likely for all of you who are pretty savvy and know, uh, know your space weather, uh, you're probably saying, yeah, I know all this. I know all this. This is, this is easy. I, I, you know, sunspots help give you these types of things. And when you don't have sunspots, then you rely on fast wind. And, you, the, and the nice thing about coronal holes is oftentimes with something this large, it'll rotate to the sun's backside and then back to the sun's front side in 27 days. So if you had a solar storm 27 days ago, you probably do. <laughs> and that's the nice thing is that solar, that, that space weather, as you get to solar minimum or closer to solar minimum, you bec it becomes very predictable. And that's, there's good news in that and there's bad news in that. The good news is that it allows you to plan ahead, uh, oftentimes for aurora, for example, if you want to do aurora tourism. Uh, it, it's nice because if you do it during the declining phase of the solar cycle and you know that you've got some big coronal holes that are going to send some fast wind toward Earth, then you can say, well, I've got a month. You know, I've got 27 days. Let's plan to have our, our trip to Iceland or, or you know, Canada, let's say, because if you have a big one, you don't have to go very far north. 
uh, let's plan to have that in, in, you know, on this month, on this day, or for this week, because that's when we know that this, whole, this coronal hole is going to be back. And maybe it'll be slightly altered, but it gave us such a great storm period last time that, you know, it most likely will give us something this time. And, and honestly, that's probably how I'm going to end up planning um, a trip if I want to plan it in advance, is I'd wait for um, a period of time, especially the declining phase, where you've got these really well-established coronal holes and you just know they're going to make it around the backside and come back to, to the sun on the earth or on the, the sun's earth side and you can go and really enjoy some very very phenomenal aurora uh, it also makes planning good for things like gps and, and that type of thing of course what it doesn't what it lets you do is also worry about the fact that you know if there's a hurricane if you go into hurricane season and you know that a hurricane is building you can time it and it's like oh gosh is there going to be a, a, some fast wind and GPS is going to get screwed up because we're going to have this big solar storm right when there's a hurricane hitting landfall that you know that allows you to not really plan but it allows you to be aware as, as well so to a great degree the declining phase is one of my favorite phases of the solar cycle because it allows you to plan ahead a little bit where it's a problem of course is anybody who's a satellite operator they'll tell you they can't stand solar or declining phase of the solar cycle. The reason for that is because we do get these periodic bursts that you can just count on. You get hit, the Earth gets hit, you get a big storm, and the Earth barely gets a chance to calm down, especially the Earth's radiation belts, before we get hit again. And what that does is it just pumps up the radiation belts and just feeds them with all this energy. And so the particles in the radiation belts, uh, especially in, in geosynchronous orbit, stay very energized. And so satellite operators have to deal with so many glitches and so many problems, uh, mainly to do with surface charging of the spacecraft. But there's other hazards that they have to deal with as well. And so satellite operators will tell you um, they just absolutely hate that three to five years worth of, of being pummeled by, uh, by these, these recurring fast, fast solar wind streams. So, so that becomes a thing. But here's the one, here's the aspect that you may not know at all. And it has to do with the heliosphere. Now, just like the Earth has our magnetic shield, you may not really have thought about it too much, but our solar system, the sun, creates its own magnetic shield. Okay, we call it the heliosphere. You've probably heard me say it more times than I can count. Now, really what it is, it's like a big bubble, right? Um, and if you push this bubble in, in, in the interstellar wind now, and you have it orbit in the Milky Way, like it is, you will actually create an interstellar wind, not very fast necessarily, but you get some kind of wind, and you will actually create a huge shock in front of this big bubble, because it's got to push all of that interstellar wind out of the way as it plows through it. So you have various boundaries, and believe it or not, Voyager 1 and 2 have crossed some of these boundaries. And that's why you, see, you keep seeing news about from Voyager 1 and 2, because we're trying to get to see if they've passed the heliopause, if they've passed the termination shock. There's all these things. We want to see, have they made it out of the, the bubble that is protecting our, our solar system and have made it out into interstellar space? That'd be really cool. You know, we're, we're really hoping for that. That's obviously a first for mankind, right? But... One of the things that, that you don't realize with this helio, heliopause being so far out um, from, from, you know, it's like, I, I, can't, I can't remember how far out, it's like double the length from Pluto, I think, from, from the sun to Pluto. It's, it's again, another sun-Pluto length before you get to, to the heliopause. And what, the, but what this bubble, this massive bubble does that we don't really pay attention to is that it protects us from things like cosmic rays, right? You get all of this stuff from the interstellar wind coming in. It's coming in all the time. You've had supernovas. We have, you know, quasars and pulsars and gravity waves. We have all sorts of stuff coming in from interstellar space. But we do have a shield that actually shields some of that stuff out, right? It's the heliopause, or I mean the heliosphere. And it's generated by our sun. It's generated by the solar wind that the sun creates blowing out. And once that solar wind gets out far enough and becomes tenuous enough, becomes, you know, basically like a vacuum, it reaches a force balance with the interstellar winds. And that's where the influence of the sun stops. 
and that's where you find this, the edge of this bubble. Now, the interesting thing, why am I bringing this up? Well, if you think of solar variability, okay, and you think of when the sun is at its maximum, it's the brightest, it's got the strongest magnetic fields, it's very active, it's shooting stuff out all the time. Its shield is very strong. But at solar minimum, the shield weakens dramatically. Okay? And when it weakens like that, then that means it's not doing a very good job of shielding out galactic cosmic rays. So here's a kind of space weather, believe it or not, that worsens at solar minimum. You'd think, oh great, at solar minimum we can all rest easy, everything's wonderful, we don't have any problems. Well, not necessarily. <laughs> because when this shield weakens, we can get 10, 20, 30 percent, maybe even higher uh, amount of cosmic ray flux into our solar system, in through the shield and into our solar system, and even into Earth's upper atmosphere um, be during, during these periods. And anybody who understands um, cosmic rays at all knows that they're, they're very complicated. When you get a cosmic ray, it's not just a single particle. It's not just a, a proton, let's say, that hits our upper atmosphere and then gets a, a, absorbed or goes all the way down to the surface. That's not true at all. You actually get a cosmic ray shower because it hits other um, uh, typically, I believe, neutral molecules in the, in the upper atmosphere. And when it, ha when it hits, this is a nuclear kind of uh, reaction. You get all sorts of things. You get three, essentially three different types, and I'm not going to go into it in super detail, but you get three different types of, of showers. They call them, uh, they've separated out in terms of muonic components. This means muons and neutrinos. These are the things that oftentimes will very easily make it down to the surface of the Earth. Here's nuclear fragments. They call this the hadronic component meaning protons and neutrons, uh, pions as well. But you also have pions here, it, but they're, you know, they, the high energy people have a way of separating stuff out. And then you also get what they call the electromagnetic component. This is where you get electricity, your electro electrons, and you also get uh, gamma rays. And, and, and I'll go ahead and I won't take this uh, too far, but what I will do, hopefully you can see this. I'm not sure how well you can see this particle shower. But if you start with the primary particle up here, there's a proton from a galactic cosmic ray. Believe it or not, and I don't know, it's, it's historical why they call them rays. They really are particles, but we've just kept the name galactic cosmic ray um, because I, I think we, historically speaking, just to be consistent, but they really are particles that come in. And there's all sorts of different types. Uh, and galactic cosmic rays are only one kind. There's also anomalous cosmic rays uh, that... Um, uh, that are totally different and, and have a totally different source. But let's just talk about these because they're more, they're more numerous and this is what we deal with. Now, I don't know if you can read this stuff, but here's an unmanned balloon at 30,000 uh, meters. We're, we're talking about meters here, not feet. Um, so obviously triple that for feet. This is, we fly these all the time. These are the ones that go, you know, sometimes go up to the rim of space. We make measurements. Um, the reason why we like doing that around 60,000 feet, uh, a little bit more than that, uh, is because this is where we get a lot of this cosmic ray showers, that some of the maximum amount of radiation. You can see part of the, part of the shower here. This is the, the um, muonic component. Uh, here's the electro, they're showing kind of electromagnetic component here. Um, here's the, looks like the nuclear, yeah, component here. They're just showing all sorts of stuff. But here's a Concorde airline flying at 15,000 meters. Here's Mount Everest at 88, 48 meters. Um, airlines fly in here. <laughs> A little bit lower. Well, maybe in here. Um, obviously, an air, a Concorde can fly a lot higher. But, but you you can see where you get you do get penetration, right down down. And some of these actually do make it all the way down to sea level. And some penetrate like neutrinos can penetrate all the way through the planet. Uh, you know, you can get a, a lot of different things. So um, this kind of reaction does affect here us here on Earth. And it affects, obviously, people in airline flights. And this is why you see in my videos why I talk so much about airline flights. And right now, if you've been watching the, the space weather forecast videos, you see that there's a, a yellow flag. And the reason for that yellow flag, which has been for the air crew and the um, you know, frequent flyers who fly 800 hours or so annually, uh, and it uh, means pilots and, and all of that, uh, the reason I, I put the yellow flag up there is that 
we have a, a now cast model um, that is showing that the, the uh, amount of radiation dose they're getting from the amount of penetration of cosmic rays is, is a, an issue right now. They're reaching more than two-thirds in, in, if they fly over 800 hours, they're reaching more than two-thirds of their recommended annual dose for a radiation worker. And, um, and that's a lot. That's a lot. And then just this last, if you've paid attention to this last forecast I did, uh, the, the new forecast now has a yellow flag for prenatal passengers. And if you go to the NARA's website and you take a look at, at their, their, their fine print, they actually talk about the, the prenatal, the yellow flag, being for just one flight. And granted, this is a 13-hour flight, but nonetheless, one flight gets them with a dose that, that is not, you know, not considered acceptable for the public. Now, the public has a much lower radiation dose than the air crew. But for a prenatal passenger, uh, that means that you know, we're, getting, we're getting some serious cosmic ray uh, effects right now. And, and this is a, one of the wonderful reasons why Space Weather, if you follow Tony Phillips on spaceweather.com, why I really laud all of the work he's doing and, and the work that um, Kent Tabiska is doing uh, trying to understand the radiation environment because we really owe it to all of, not just the, the commercial passengers and the crews, the air crews, we just, we just owe it to everybody to be able to better characterize this, especially as these solar activity cycles right now are beginning to wane. Now, they're, they're, so, so they're, the max solar maximums aren't as big as they used to be. The solar minimums are becoming deeper. And as we sit through this, this period, what we might be going through is a grand minimum. It's hard to know. Uh, it might be a Dalton-like minimum. But as we sit through this period, we are seeing far more uh, cosmic rays than we've ever seen during the space age. And, and so there, this is a very hot topic right now, especially when it comes to, um, and I'll, I'll pass on to this, especially when it comes to um, flight safety and space tourism, which is popping up, astronauts you know, that have to deal with it back in the, uh, in the ISS, and possibly you know, new careers that are gonna be coming up where we're dealing with um, people who wanna do uh, fixing of satellites in, in near Earth space or mining asteroids, or on top of that, wanting to fly to Mars, because in, in 2032, we're gonna have another opportunity to go to Mars because of the way the position of our, Mars relative to Earth, it just makes the, the, the trip much easier to do, a uh, much shorter travel time. And, and yet this is, as far as the solar, um, the solar activity cycle is concerned, it's making it one of the worst times to go because we have such a penetration of galactic cosmic rays. And I'll talk about this plot right here. I don't know if you can see it very well. But this is a record high. This is from 2001 to 2011. So this is, this is uh, when we started going into uh, solar minimum, our last solar minimum. And the previous space age record high for cosmic rays at Earth was the, where this blue dashed line was. And as we went into sol our last solar minimum, we beat that record by a lot. And it's now, and, and as we've gone into this, as we're going into this solar minimum, we're seeing record highs yet again. So we've, I believe we've beaten this solar minimum record even again. So the, it's, it's a very serious um, topic that, uh, that we're trying as academics. We're doing our best to cover. But it becomes, you know, it, it becomes so much more relevant to, to uh, you know, the ordinary person. Um, I had someone pass me the other day a, an article, a medical article, saw, saying that uh, pacemakers were having single event upsets that were measurable because during, during airline flights um, because of galactic cosmic ray impingement. And it's like, wow, <laughs> we're going to have to make our pacemakers radiation hard <laughs> for people who, wanna f who fly frequently because they're resetting. I mean, who wants their pacemaker resetting simply because they get on an airplane? You know, the, these, I, I know this type of stuff is a little bit scary to think about, but these are the things that we need to do. We just need to do them. We need to buck up and do them and admit that, you know, there are things about space weather that we don't quite have a good handle on and, and that we've got to, to protect our citizens and protect, protect humanity. So, so this is part of why I do what I do. Okay, so now that I've scared you to death, <laughs> um, solar cycle, where are we now? Uh, 
as I, as I finish talking about how frightening it is that we are going, and I probably should have updated this chart, um, as I scare you to death about how, how, how much the solar cycle is diminishing, um, there is some good news. Now, we are, you know, as you can see, here's solar, solar maximum, near solar maximum, here's solar minimum. You can see sunspots all over the place here, nothing, <laughs> completely spotless disk. Um, and this was in May of 2017, so it tells you how old this chart is. But what I wanted to share with you, and, and I could put the link in um, so you guys can watch it too, because it's a very interesting uh, thing to, to pay attention to, is the, uh, the number of spotless days. And there are a lot of other proxies that kind of give us an idea of, of what the next cycle is going to be like. Um, but the number of spotless days is an easy one uh, because it's very readily available and, and it's very easy to interpret. So um, I, I will, like I said, I'll put a link to it so you guys can follow it too. But what is, what's becoming interesting is that when you have um, a, a number of spotless days, you, th there's, a, there's a trend that happens. If you have a, a solar that the next solar cycle is going to be very, very low and slow, the number of spotless days does not ramp up very fast. And, but when it ramps up, it reaches a really high number. And here's, here's a plot of this, for example. And if you look at the, the dark blue and the two cyan lines, hopefully you can see the two cyan lines. Um, this is an example of cycles that ramp up very slowly in their number of spotless days. They come up real slow, but they reach a really high number. And this is solar cycle 10 through 15 and cycle 24, which was the cycle we were previously in. Um, or, yeah, that we're, that we're getting, yeah. Um, and uh, uh, it, 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 because it ramped up slowly, but it reached a high number, that gave us the indication, for all of these cycles, that gives us the indication that if we have a new cycle, and, it, and um, the spotless days as we, we approach solar minimum, if the number of spotless days ramps up really slowly, then most likely the very next cycle we're going to have is going to be, it's going to be small. But if you have a cycle that ramps up quickly, where the number of spotless days gets very, very high very quickly, then you can have, and, and it, is, it typically plateaus at a low number because the new cycle starts. It starts quickly and, it, and oftentimes the activity increases. So what we've been watching here, this green line is where we are, uh, at least where we were a year ago. We've actually continued, but it, we've continued up this red line very, very uh, carefully. We've got, it's, it's almost matching it. Uh, if anything, it's maybe a little bit above it. So we're ramping up extremely quickly when it comes to spotless days. And a lot of scientists have begun to really wonder that because of that, it, we may not be sitting at a, a, a solar cycle, a solar minimum like we were in the previous cycle which is good news especially for things like cosmic rays because with cosmic rays, you know, the longer you sit with a minimum, the more uh, galactic cosmic rays penetrate, the higher the, higher the flux is uh, impinging on Earth. So we've got good news in the sense that it looks like the cycle is going to be starting sooner than 2020, maybe in 2019, and we're not going to potentially have an extended minimum like we did uh, in this previous cycle. What that what it doesn't really tell us necessarily is whether or not the next cycle is going to be bigger or smaller, but we do know it's coming. So we're not going to go back to a monitor minimum, thank goodness, uh, because that would, that would be a whole other world of hurt for us when it comes to uh, galactic cosmic rays and when, what that would do for radiation dose during airline flights. But there is a link here. I don't know if you can see this. Um, this is a good place to go look for and track because uh, they, they're pretty good about putting up... Um, these, you know, keeping the data up to date, and you can get a much better updated plot of this, um, the, this solar cycle activity. Okay, so now here's the next thing. Um, what I wanted to, and I, I probably got the title of this because I pulled this out of a different talk, but what I wanted to, to mention about this is if you see here's 1800, 1850, 1950, 2000. Um, again, here's that 11-year cycle that we were talking about, right? And you can see, again, the variability as it moves on. There's the Dalton minimum there. Here's um, um, back in 2001 and 2003. Even though we have cosmic rays that we have to worry about being, being um, a problem during solar minimums and during small solar cycles, it doesn't necessarily mean that we won't get large events, some extreme events, during small solar cycles as well. As a matter of fact, 
there's some evidence to indicate that the biggest one, the Carrington event that we got, was actually during a cycle in 1859 that was lower than what is average. Here's the number average across all cycles. Okay? And here's another one. The 1921 superstorm happened in a cycle that was lower than average. And then here again, the superstorms in 2001 and 2003, some of them we call the Halloween events. Again, this was just an average cycle. Now that's not to say that we don't have something that happens at higher than average cycles. One of, one of our standard, what we call the standard candles, happened in 1989. That's when the Toronto Stock Exchange closed um, and we had people without power for nine hours. It was a, and I actually met somebody who lived through that. Uh, and he said, my gosh, when I told him about it, he says, you know what, I remember that. And he says, I never knew what it was caused by. <laughs> I said, oh, okay, well, we know. <laughs> It was a solar storm, and it was due to a, a big uh, coronal mass ejection uh, being launched from the sun during uh, one of the bigger cycles uh, out here. I think it was this one. Or no, this one. Uh, but at any rate, we do have some of the biggest events on record happening during slow and small cycles. So just because we have the weakening cycles doesn't mean that we are in the clear when it comes to massive solar activity. Um, and if anyone is in doubt, then um, I have three solar or three coronal mass ejections I could refer you to, and solar flares. One of the the most in, intense periods was September of 2017, uh, where we had two of the largest flares uh, of the um, of this past solar cycle, and we had uh, two Carrington class events being launched, or near Carrington class events being launched, depending upon your perspective. And during this cycle th that we have survived, <laughs> um, we, you know, we just went through, I'm teasing, that we just went through, there were actually three Carrington class or near Carrington class events that occurred. Um, two, like I said, in 2017 and uh, one in 2012. So these, it, this is no joke that we can get very, very large events during these weak cycles. So it doesn't mean we get to rest on our laurels. Now, why, I'm going to go into this now, this is now about why um, we have, uh, let's see how I can talk about this. This is, the, uh, what I'm going to talk about now is essentially how we have uh, m many different types of activity cycles that are kind of laid on top of each other. And what I've done is I've taken some data from, um, I believe it's va the last, I have to, I'll put the link to the paper. There is an open link to the paper that was published, I think, in, in AppJ. Um, that, that basically takes total solar irradiance measurements from 1000 AD, essentially, to 2100, you know, to, to the current day. And it's one of the longest records I've been able to find where they're using the same data and they have created models or they're comparing different models in the paper. So it's a, it's a very nice paper. Um, and as you can see, here's some of the, some of the different data uh, modeling that they've done. But you can see here, when you have a, a, a timeline this tight, the 11-year cycle just looks almost like fuzz. It's so, it's so ratty. Um, but then over this, of course, you can see the modulation from other cycles. And you can see if you, if you do a low-pass filter on this, you start pulling out other variability that's very different. And so what they did in this paper is that they took, um, the, the, they took this, this data and they took models and they calibrated the, the total solar irradiance measurement, which is basically the brightness of the sun being measured over time. And they've, they've uh, laid it over and, and calibrated their models uh, with, these, with the lower variability in the data. And you have multiple, you can see there's lots of different uh, minder, minimums. You have an Oort minimum, you have the medieval minimum, you have the Wolf minimum, the Spore minimum, the late medieval minimum, the Maunder minimum, this is the famous one that everybody talks about, the Dalton minimum, again, more famous, right? And then you have the modern minimum, and then here's the grand maximum that we've experienced. Now, just so you can see, and this is the reason why I did this, don't worry about all the different lines and all that stuff, that's not what's, what's super important right now. What's important to understand is if I can take a piece of paper or something and cover <laughs> Most people, you know, I don't, it's not large enough, most people only take a look at the Maunder minimum, right, through the Dalton, just this, that's it, right? And they think, oh gosh, we're going to go to another Maunder minimum, and, you know, and, they, and they, they take this data and they run with it. But, you know, look at this. Look at this variability. There's a ton of variability. 
that we have absolutely no idea about. I mean, we were doing the best we can, but we don't have, you know, back in 1000 AD, what did we measure the sun with, right? We have to go back to ice cores. In this case, we're going to, to uh, isotopes, I think carbon-14 and solar solar radiance measurements to, to, to get this information. Um, and, and so we're piecing it together as scientists the best we can. But you have so much variability on top of things. Here's a, a, an example of a wavelet analysis. Many of you have seen probably frequency analyses, but some of you may have not seen wavelet analysis, which is a very unique way of, of bracketing things. And, and when you have many different cycle periodicities overlaying each other, wavelet analysis is a really neat um, tool because it allows you to separate these things a lot better. And I am not an expert on wavelet analysis at all. But here is that, here's just a, a segment of that, that, uh, that period. Um, and they've done t several different wavelet analyses and using, using different, different models, overlays, that type of thing. Um, and, uh, oh, I guess it is the whole period. I'm sorry. Look, uh, from 1,000 to 2,100. Okay, it just looked different for some reason. And when they do the wavelet analysis, really all you look for is you look for red and you look for coherence in red. You see a little bit here, these little buckets here are showing that we're getting periodicity. And you see it here, and this is the, the time here, I mean, the, the period in years. So that's eight, if you can't read it, there's 16. So that little hump right there, that's 11 years. So that's, that's the 11-year cycle they're pulling out. But look at what someone else, they're, what else they're pulling out. They're pulling out, here's a really deep red right here. That's about 100, right now, about 128, 100, anywhere about 120 years-ish. Because um, you can see there's a little spread. You get another one here, somewhere around 200. You get even another one, but I think that may be just the, the, the base of this, the, the, the edge of the wavelet analysis. But if you do it again in a slightly different one, here's again that 11-year cycle. You can see the periodicity here. Then if you get another one in 128 years-ish, okay? Another, another peak around 200, another peak even higher. So when they, they talk about this stuff, they say the global wavelets present periodicities in 11 years, plus or minus 3, 60 years, plus or minus 20. They show this tiny little hump. I don't know if I... Care, care about that too much. They're trying to talk about um, the Gleisberg cycle, is, which is kind of debated right now um, because there are some errors that have been shown that Gleisberg may have done. Um, and it's kind of hard, but there's a lot of variability in that particular one. About 120 years, they say plus or minus 30 years because there's spread. 240 years, plus or minus uh, 40 years. So you've got one, two, three, four, at least four. And I know there are people actually see ones that are about three years as well. There's like a three-year periodicity as well. And all of these cycles or these pseudo-cycles with this, this um, error that we have on here, the plus or minus, you know, give or take this much, all of these cycles are smashed together into how the sun reacts. This is why when we look at these long time scales of solar variability, it's just all over the map, blah, 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 right? Because you've got to add all these things together. It's this wave on top of this wave on top of this one. And so you've got the 11-year Schwabe cycle. You've got the Yoshimura Gleisberg cycle of 60 to 80 years. You've got, you know, and they, and they try to associate that with, with certain physical processes, like the solar bari baricentric motion. Um, and, you know, there's all sorts of papers on this type of stuff. But we just don't have the kind of data that we want. And so I wanted to show you this. Um, again, this is also from that from the Velasco paper. Uh, here's 1,000 to 2,100. You can see the 11-year periodicity. You can see here, this is the, um, a longer periodicity. This is the 120-year component. And then here's the 240-year component. So they're all separated out in the model. So imagine just adding these together. And so what you get is you get an 11-year cycle, but depending upon whether you're at the peak of this or the trough of this, is going to make an amplitude modulation. It's going to make this cycle bigger or smaller, right? So if you're at the peak here, let's try to find one here. How about this? You're at the peak of this cycle, right? Here's a 120-year cycle. So you'd think that that 11-year cycle would be huge, right? Because it's also at the peak of this 120-year cycle. But look at this. It's at the trough of this 240-year cycle. So they kind of cancel out, maybe. I don't know, kind of, hmm. You know, it's hard to say. So here's one where you actually have a peak of the 240-year cycle, a peak of the 120-year cycle, and sure enough, look how big the amplitude is, you know. And, and, and I may be interpreting these incorrectly because this is, these are all normalized. But you end up getting, they probably couldn't pull out all the amplitude variation in these. 
Um, but this is what happens, is that you get modulation of the 11-year cycle that not only changes the amplitude, changes the intensity of the cycle, but it also changes the, the duration of it. It may spread it out a little bit. It may shrink it down a little bit. It's hard to say exactly what it's going to do. And because we don't really have that much data, it makes it incredibly difficult for us to make these predictions any better than we have. And so when we see changes in the solar cycle activity, like we have with these last two cycles, this is why <laughs> when, you want, when you say, OK, well, it can't be that complicated. It's 11 years, right? How come you guys can't make a prediction when solar minimum is going to hit? Well, uh, and if I go back here, you know, <laughs> um, <laughs> it's this variability that makes it so incredibly difficult for us to, to understand. And when we only have modern measurements from essentially this period, from here to, to the edge of this plot, I mean, look at all that variability that we don't really have great measurements for and that we've got to try to piece together and we've got to try to calibrate and all this kind of thing. So that is why it becomes so incredibly difficult. So now I'm back to, uh, and here, you know what, I'll pause for just a second because I want to see, I'm going to go to the live YouTube feed and see our, if I can answer any questions right now before I get into a little bit about the solar, the, the, um, solar wind. So let's see. Thank you, doctor, for your live session. Amplitude frequency, does that change during the cycle change? Yes. That's amazing. What effect is that? The sun is amazing. Yes. Um, correct short time span. Is, the grand sol is this grand solar minimum we are headed into related to the Mayan 2012 forecast of starting a new long count cycle? Wow. I don't know. I'd need to be an astrosociologist to answer that one. I have no idea. That's a really interesting question. Hmm. Okay, let's see. So I will look into that. I'm so glad that, that this is going to stay up so I get to look at you guys' comments and questions. And it gets me thinking uh, in uh, a lot of other ways. Okay, so with this minimum, some asking about mini ice age type event, your thoughts. Ah, okay. Also, does Saturn have an effect for our sun? Well, that's a very interesting question. Um, you know, Jupiter and Saturn are very big and massive bodies. And, and whether or not their tidal influences um, have any effect, I mean, you know, to, to a great degree, I mean, when you look at, at the planets of the solar system, if you were to, you know, kind of scrub your eyes for a second and look at the sun as if it were a planet, I know, stupid, but okay, humor me. Um, then you could look at all the planets as being moons, right? The planets would be the sun's moons. And, well, you look at Earth and you look at our moon, and you say, well, there's definitely some tidal pulls, right? There's definitely our ocean tides. You know, there's all sorts of things that, that are affected by just our single moon. So you can imagine with the sun, even though it's so incredibly massive, well, the Earth is very massive compared to the moon as well. And so it's, it, it's an interesting concept to think that, yeah, there, there could easily be some, some tidal variabilities uh, associated, especially when planets align, you know, when the planets are all kind of in a row and all tugging on the sun, um, you know, in, in, in one fashion or another. Uh, you definitely could get some of that. And I, and I am not a solar astronomer, so that's not something I've ever um, considered. But I, I would imagine that is, that is definitely the case. And there may even be some papers written on it. Um, because there's certain variabilities we can see. Once again, the problem is that the time scales that we're talking about are very long compared to the time scales of, um, uh, of you know, humans and, and our modern instrumentation. And it just dawned on me that this probably looks very scary. <laughs> so I probably shouldn't show this too much. Uh, maybe I should scoot this over. Otherwise, everybody's going to freak out. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, and then, OK, and then regarding this, the, the minimum, the minimum, these little ice ages, you know, it's completely possible. Um, I think here's, and here's a, maybe another wacky perception, um, but to some degree, we, we have to say that, you know, global, the, this, climate, this climate change that we're going through, and I have very little opinions when it comes to climate change because I'm not a climate scientist. So I often will tell people when they ask me, what do I think about climate change and the sun's effect on it, I will say, well, climate science is hard, and I kind of leave it at that. 
But what I do think is, is kind of fortuitous is the fact that we are kind of diminishing right now in solar activity cycle. So if anything, um, you know, the sun is helping us out a little bit, you know, in terms of, of trying to get on top of our own woes and problems. But um, if in terms of having another mini ice age, such as what we had during the Dalton or the Maunder, well, if, if the climate scientists are, are definitely saying that, you know, we've got a lot of anthropomorphic effects that are, that are artificially heating the, the upper atmosphere, well, then obviously that's not going to allow us to, to dip down nearly to the levels that we had when we had no industrial age and we weren't burning fossil fuels at a crazy rate. So obviously the effects are going to offset one another. To what degree that we're going to, no pun intended, I don't mean temperature, I just mean to what level are we, are, are the effects going to offset? I wouldn't even begin to venture, I guess, because like, like I said, I don't have the skills in, in terrestrial meteorology to, to be able to answer that question. And I know there's a very specific set of skills that you need to be able to do that. So I, I think if we look historically at ice ages and we look historically at least the, mini, the, the, the little mini ice ages that we've had, I'm not sure we're going to go to that level um, simply because we do have this, this, I don't want to call it a benefit, but we, we do have this, uh, this man-made effect. Um, but only, only time will tell because we really don't understand uh, you know, where our cycles are taking us. There's a lot of, of activity with solar physicists just trying to determine whether or not we're going to have a couple smaller cycles and then disappear into a maunder, or we're going to have a couple small cycles and then jump back to a grand maximum. There's a lot of argument going on in there, and um, it's a very interesting time. That's all I can say. As a radio amateur, is there hope for a big solar cycle like solar cycle 23 again? Um, in terms of, of your lifetime, maybe not. Maybe not. Um, again, it's not that there won't be. There will be, but us humans just don't live very long <laughs> relative to the sun's timeline. So, you know, you can have, if you have two quiet cycles, well, there's pretty much the rest of your life. You know, you got 20, 20, 25 years um, gone like that. So maybe, maybe near the end of your life, uh, but it doesn't look like this next cycle is going to be a big one. Um, might it be a little bit, either, well, there's arguments right now as to whether it's going to be a little bit larger than the one we have, we've been in, or a little bit smaller. Um, but it's, it's probably going to be on the same, um, around the same air, uh, uh, intensity as what we've had. Um, great honest reply. Yeah. Oh, you're welcome. I, I, I just, you know, I don't, I don't have a problem <laughs> telling you what I don't know. I, I really don't. Um, my, my expertise, and, and this is the way you, you find a lot of scientists, I think. Um, we have very, uh, because we have to, there's so much to know when it comes to space weather and solar physics and terrestrial physics and, um, you know, everything in between. You know, you, you've got so many different disciplines and they're so chock full of in very difficult problems that if you want to get a PhD in something and become a scientist, you really have to choose a very small, narrow area. Now, some people are able to branch out and become, you know, over the course of their entire careers, they can branch out and become amazing and, and have a huge breadth. Uh, if you want an example, you can just look at my thesis advisor, uh, Dr. Chris Russell. That man has, has just, he's a staggering number of publications and uh, has, has pretty much touched on everything under the sun um, and uh, deals, dabbles in, in all sorts of, of solar terrestrial phenomena as well as out in planetology and, and, and planetary physics. So, um, you know, it is possible to get a wider breadth, but even at that, there's, there are ar arenas that, that you will never be that competent in just because you just don't have the time to do the amount of research you need to be able to, to know everything. So I don't have a problem um, saying what I don't know, and I just hope that people who do know then come and educate me, and, and uh, I just hope that over the course of my life I'm able to, to get enough knowledge to be able to answer your questions in an honest manner. So I appreciate it when you guys recognize that. Um, okay, let's see. So what I will do at this point, um, I was just looking for to see if I have other questions here that are interesting. I'll stop. I'll, I'll, I'll get back to this. So let me, let me now go on to the second part of this, and this will be faster because there's not a lot left here. But what I wanted to talk about 
is, is specifically um, how the sun changes a, a bit, with, especially when it comes to coronal holes and uh, solar wind. I, I mentioned, I, t I told you I would uh, talk about, mm, excuse me, I told you I would talk about um, why so the, the space weather becomes so uh, filled with solar storms. Why, why would a coronal hole and why would fast wind give us that many solar storms uh, compared to coronal mass ejections, you know, when, when we have an active sun? And really, it, it, it comes down to kind of like a, a, a logistics, a, a, a geometry and topology of how the sun's magnetic field works. And I just kind of threw these up here, um, and I, I'll, I'll talk about it more in a second. But we're, we're, what we're going to, what I'm going to try to go over a little bit, and I, I apologize for not having, um, I haven't thought through this to a great degree, because it was something I kind of added at the last minute. But really what we have to kind of keep in mind when we think of, the sun and we think of how solar wind works is, is really the, the magnetic topology of the sun. And that's what you're kind of looking at here. You're looking at uh, a magnet. Essentially, the sun is kind of like a magnet. You've got the northern hemisphere having a particular polarity. In this case, it's positive, but negative polarity on the southern half. The reason why you see this, what we're calling, the, this is the magnetic neutral line. The reason why you see it tilted like this, um, this is during solar minimum, a very quiet sun. But the reason why you see it tilted like this is to remind us this is not a geographic equator. It's not just a straight line because this is not just, you know, north, south, east, west. This is magnetic. And the magnetic uh, configuration of, um, of the sun has, is, is variable. It, it, it definitely changes. As a matter of fact, it reverses very, very quickly uh, relative to, let's say, Earth's magnetic field reversal. So this here when we look at this magnetic neutral line, if, if all of the field that comes out from the top, you can see the arrows going out, they're all going outward. But if you look at uh, the southern half, you can see all the arrows, they're going inward. See all that? They're going in. And what, where the boundary is, right here, is where we have these streamers. You see, you, see, you see the field kind of going in. These are closed field lines. When they open like this, they, this becomes the solar wind. The closed field doesn't become solar wind, but the open field does. You often get fast solar wind going out from the poles, um, but the magnetic field is going inward here. It's going outward there. Um, but the fast wind is still blowing out both sides. And you get fast wind blowing out this way. And we call these streamers, and it's a slow solar wind. But what you see here is that you see the arrow going out and then the arrow coming in. Well, right at that boundary is a current sheet. Okay, It's also the plasma sheet. And this is where we get a bit more density. You hear people talk about crossing through a sector structure, a, sec uh, um, a uh, sector boundary crossing, SSBC. I think uh, NOAA uses all the time. They're talking about this. They're talking about crossing this. But you can imagine if this current sheet and this, this place where you go from field going one direction to field going another direction, basically field from a north pole, northern hemisphere, and field from the southern hemisphere, well, that current sheet lines up with this magnetic neutral line, okay? which means it's curved. Now, so extend this out into space. So this streamer goes all the way around. I could probably get my slinky again if I have it. Yeah, Remember my slinky from last time? We'll do it again. These things are amazing. Um, so if you have the, the, the round magnetic field sticking out, if I can do it like this, the round magnetic field sticking out, from, the, from the, um, the sun and the closed field lines, it goes around in a toroid like this. Okay, that's the closed field of the sun. But you also have field coming out just, a, just around it that caused this streamer. But the thing is, is that the field lines kind of bend. See how I'm trying to make it kind of like a neutral, or be kind of a, a, a bendy kind of thing? Well, that's what happens, is that you have this streamer that comes out, but it's, it's depending upon where it is, the thing is kind of tilted. And so it comes out in a sheet and it's tilted. We call this the ballerina skirt because as it twists, it, it actually looks kind of like a tutu. <laughs> and that's exactly what we're modeling right here, is that you actually see this kind of fold, see this folded thing? As the sun rotates and it streams out this solar wind, you get this kind of folding, okay? And these folds have a lot to do with the structure. And I'm trying to kind of orient your mind um, because we're, we're going to talk a, a little bit about this when it comes to how the, um, the solar wind, uh, you can get fast and slow wind streams. Because as you go through these, this ballerina skirt, imagine during a more busy sun, 
this ballerina skirt tilts more and more and more. And I, and I didn't bring a, um, I didn't include a graph that, that showed that, and I probably should have. But this ballerina sk uh, skirt tilts more and more and more. And so you get these waves, these, these kind of periodic, you know, what we call Parker spiral waves. They, they actually get steeper and steeper and steeper. And when you get to solar maximum, it becomes a total mess. But what it does mean is that if this is the region where you get slow solar wind, because this is the region where the streamers are, right, then you will pass through that region, and then you'll pass out of it, and then you'll pass through it again, and you'll pass out of it, just like this. You'll pass, if I were to, to fly a spacecraft right through this, or rather Earth, right through this, and this stuff is expanding and coming out all the time. You're passing through one sheet, then you're passing through the other, then you're passing through it again. It's like these waves coming over and over and over again. So this is why when you deal with coronal holes and you deal with, with slow solar wind compared to fast solar wind, why you get these kind of wave-like things. This is why I wanted to show it to you. It's kind of like a wave's rippling out from an ocean, or when you drop a rock in a lake and it ripples outward, kind of like that. It's like a cross between that and a sprinkler head. And I'll talk about the sprinkler head in a minute. But there's variability when it comes to that stuff. Now, what I showed you was solar minimum, OK? You've got basically solar wind from one hemisphere coming out this, word, this way, solar wind coming out from another hemisphere this way. The, the length of the arrows are how fast the solar wind is. As you can see, the solar wind slows down quite a bit right around the equator region, right? Really, really slow, very, very small arrows. Right, and very, very fast over the poles, OK? This is when you get a very nice ballerina skirt. This happens during solar minimum. This happens during the ascending phase to some degree. This happens during the declining phase. You get a very decently ordered sun, which means you get very clear streams of fast wind and slow wind, you know, one after the other in these waves. And the fast wind will catch up to the slow wind and it will cause shocks, and it will drive a storm, and it will compress the stuff in front of it. And it's, bam, it hits Earth, and it's like, whoa, the Earth is taken back, almost like being hit by a breaker, um, you know, meaning a wave, like, a, like an ocean wave. Um, but this is what it looks like in solar minimum. Now, if you get to solar maximum, well, <laughs> the sun, if, I've, if you've never heard me say the sun's like a lava lamp, well, here you go. When, when the sun reaches solar maximum, its magnetic field hemispheres are changing. The positive is switching to negative. The negative is switching to positive. You, you, it just becomes a total mess. And look at this. This is exactly what we see. We see magnetic polarities of all different types all the time. Fast wind and slow wind are all over the place because there's no longer nice polar coronal holes that we typically see during solar minimum or to even the declining phase. You've got coronal holes everywhere. You've got active regions. You've got all sorts of things popping off the sun. So it becomes very, very complicated. This is why you don't see a lot of solar storms from coronal holes, from fast wind, just hitting on of its own during solar maximum. I mean, not only do you have coronal mass ejections and solar flares occurring all the time, but you also don't have really well-ordered solar wind streams. You don't have nice you know, coronal holes that, that give you just a, a single stream of fast wind for a long period, extended period of time, and then it stops and you're back into slow wind. And then another fast wind stream, and then back into slow wind. You just don't have that. What you get is a jumble. So when it comes to, to space weather during solar maximum, this is another reason why it's dominated by solar flares and coronal mass ejections and not by coronal holes. And as you can see, why it's so difficult to plan <laughs> for aurora outings. I mean, you basically kind of just, you know, do one of these numbers saying, oh, well, I think there's a, there's a bad, you know, there's a big sunspot on the sun, um, and it looks pretty ugly. Let, let's go in the next week. You know, but you don't have that wonderful luxury of 27 days to, to plan your event out in the future. And this is just another example of that. Um, this is actually from Ulysses. You can see the sun, solar, min solar minimum, solar maximum, essentially they're trying to show that. And this is actual data being shown. Uh, again, the distance outside of, uh, for away from the sun is the speed of the solar wind. The color is the polarity of the magnetic field. And you're seeing very, this is uh, actual data. So you're seeing in 1994 as Ulysses went from the southern pole up to the northern pole in 1995. 
you see dramatically how fast, how fast the solar wind is, and then boom, it goes all the way down to like 300 kilometers a second. This is the slow solar wind. You got a little, probably an, even an eruption or maybe some fa a fast, uh, a fast solar wind burst from uh, a coronal hole maybe. And then, but it stays for the most part, stays pretty slow. And then as soon as you pass back out of that ballerina skirt region, bam, you're back out into the polar regions and you're getting the, the very fast solar wind again. Very, very nice during solar, uh, solar minimum declining phase. As a matter of fact, I think solar minimum was 1996. So this was declining phase. This, this, is, this is the prime time for coronal hole fast wind induced space weather. And this is why satellite operators hate it. <laughs> because it just is so ordered, so perfect. Every 27 days as the sun rotates around, bam, we get hit by the same stream again. And it rotates around again, bam, the same one again. So it just, they, it, Earth, it just gets rattled during this time. Here's solar maximum. Now this is 2001. This is really right when solar maximum was. Here's Ulysses again. Look at the colors, red and blue and red and blue and red and blue and red and blue and, you know, it's just a mess, right? Now you're getting a couple fast wind streams here that are all red polarity. It's all one polarity here, here, here. Up here the, in the northern hemisphere, you're getting one polarity with the fast wind. But really, in terms of getting fast solar wind, it's just a mess. And here's one right here that's very fast. This, I'm not sure if this was just, if they took out coronal mass ejections or not. This looks like this might have been a mass ejection because you actually have a polarity change across the boundary of it. And that is very typical of a coronal hole or a, a coronal mass ejection, that, that uh, you have a sector boundary crossing right in the middle of the structure. Um, very, very common. But you can see it's just a complete mess during solar max. So really, again, especially for those who want to do aurora photography and stuff like that and want to plan your next aurora outing, the best time to go if you really want to, if you have to have, you know, a long time to plan, two weeks or more, um, the best time to do it is probably during the declining phase when we absolutely know um, that we're going to get coronal holes that are, that are substantially large and they're most likely going to stay very coherent around a full rotation of the sun. So you can plan um, pretty confidently 27 days in advance. Now, with that caveat, with that being said, I give you the caveat that, you know, past performance is not a, what, what do they say, an indicator of future, or past, past, yeah. You know how it is with the stock market, right? Um, I've, I have been wrong, and there are many times when it looks like a coronal hole will be absolutely fantastic and totally robust, and by the time it rotates around, to the sun, to the, the Earth side of the sun, it's a mess. And it's just like, well, what happened? It just closed up, or there was a big eruption right next to it, and then that reconfigured everything, and then that hole completely closes up. So, you know, there's no guarantee. Um, but it, it is, it's, it's about as good a guarantee as you can get if you're trying to plan ahead. So here's just another view of that. And now what we've got down below, this is again Ulysses data. Um, we're looking at, at solar cycle 22, it's minimum. You can see again, really slow solar wind near the equator, um, where that ballerina skirt, where you're getting near the neutral line and the streamers are, what we call the coronal streamer belt. You can see cycles 21 and 22. So the minimum of cycle 22 right here. Um, and then you have cycle 23, solar maximum. This is this cycle, and this is what it looked like. What a nightmare, completely nightmarish. And then you get down to the minimum of solar cycle 23, and unfortunately, Ulysses did, petered out around here. Um, but you can see as it was making its, its, its polar crossing once again, um, it, it looks pretty, it's, it's beginning to get pretty really well, you know, pretty well ordered. You're not seeing red and blue everywhere. You can see that it switched from cycle 22 to cycle 23. What was blue in the southern hemisphere becomes red in the southern hemisphere. What was red in the northern hemisphere becomes blue in the northern hemisphere. Um, we don't have any data here because Ulysses uh, died at that point. Um, but um, you, know, you could see that, so you could see the polarity reversal, but you can see the ordering of the, of the uh, solar wind speed again going very, very slow as we get to solar minimum. So you get order during the minimums, mess during the maximum, and order during the minimums again. And, uh, and that's really what I wanted to show here. So one last thing, let's see what I've got. Um, I can talk a little bit about the, the Parker spiral. Let me let me take a look and see really fast what I've got left here, because I know we're kind of running out of time. 
Yeah, this is pretty much all I wanted to talk about was just for the Parker. I'll, I'll give you a little bit more information about the Parker Spiral. Just in case you, you aren't familiar with the Parker Spiral or heard people talk about it or you have a hard time visualizing what that is. If we take the sun and we rotate, and I guess I could have shown this before I showed the Ulysses stuff. But if we take this, the sun and we rotate the sun, but it's always, remember, the sun is always spitting out solar wind, and it's always spitting out solar wind in a radial fashion. So if you, if you spit out, let's say, a parcel, I mean, it looks like a piece of cake. I'm not sure why. <laughs> They're trying to just call it a parcel of solar wind, not really trying to give it any shape or, or, or function or anything. But this is the position where, uh, on, the, on the source of the sun, or the surface of the sun, when this parcel first left the sun. Then let's say at time, you know, the second time as the sun is rotated a little bit, it shoots off another parcel. And by the time you do, 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 you've rotated through, you've shot off all these parcels, by the time that, where that first parcel had, had been shot off the sun at that location, by the time the sun rotates so that that source region is over here, let's say it shot off these, this many parcels. Well, you start noticing it looks like a spiral, right, if you draw a line right through it. And the thing is, is that when the sun launches material, in the solar wind, because it's always blowing off stuff, part of itself. It's, a, it's its upper atmosphere. It's the part of the upper atmosphere that it can't contain within its gravity, right? So this stuff is escaping. It's reached escape velocity, and it's, and it's leaving. Um, but there's magnetic field that's associated with that. And the one cool thing that we understand uh, as, as space physicists, or as, as physicists of electromagnetic phenomena is that the magnetic field and the electric fields obviously associated with it are frozen into the field or frozen into the to the to the, the material the the plasma and and so as this stuff leaves there's going to be a magnetic field line or magnetic field that's that's associated with it and that magnetic field is consistent and it's kind of threading through all of this stuff so as you can see it creates this spiral and it's kind of the same thing and I didn't get a picture of this but it's kind of the same thing as if you had thought of a of garden sprinkler. If you think of a garden sprinkler that, that rotates, um, you start seeing as it spits off water, you see it come out in these Archimedean spiral arms, right? Same thing when you look at the galaxy, like the Milky Way galaxy, it's got these spiral arms. Well, it's the same thing here. You know, it's just the consequence of something rotating and spitting off stuff at the same time. Um, but we call that, so, so Eugene Parker, and, and those of you who know about the Parker Solar Probe, he, this is the gentleman who, who created, who, who did the theory behind the, the Parker spiral and basically had the origin of the solar wind and the whole concept of it. Of course, as his contemporaries laughed at him, he held fast to his theories and held fast to the, to the work and the derivations that he had done. And good thing he did because this is what we've come to um, you know, see validated over and over and over again through, um, through experimentation and through, um, through data uh, observations. But here's another way of looking at it. So I told you about the Parker, you know, about the, the, the um, parcels being shot off. So if you, think of a, if you think of this now in terms of uh, solar wind, solar wind streaming, right, whether it's be a fast wind or a slow wind, you get a parcel that's shot off, and then the sun rotates a little bit, and you get another parcel shot off, and then it rotates a little bit more, and you get another parcel shot off. And so you see this again with these arrows, right? You see this, this kind of this Parker spiral being shot out. Well, here's the thing. With a fast wind stream, the, the parcels are being shot out faster. And so the, the spiral actually has a different tilt to it than the stuff that's being shot off slower. When the stuff is shot off more slowly, the sun can rotate further before that, that parcel gets out too far. So you actually, with the slow stream, actually get a different curve than you do with the fast stream. And that interaction, because what happens is that the fast stream, in a sense, catches up to the slow stream. And when you get that interaction, that is what causes the wave. That is what causes compression. You can oftentimes get shock waves. You get all sorts of scattering. You get, there's all sorts of phenomena that people, there are people who spend their entire lives studying the interactions, what we call uh, stream interaction regions, SIRs, or co-rotating interaction regions, CIRs. We call them that if they're, they've rotated around the sun and come back again. If we've seen them more than once, they're CIR. That just means that they're, you know, they're persistent. Um, but these interaction regions, these are the regions that cause the solar storms at Earth. So when you see solar storms at Earth caused by fast wind, it's really not the fast wind stream itself that ends up being the strongest part of the storm. It's the area just before it. 
It's where the fast wind is hitting that slow wind, compressing it, just like you would compress when you, when you are in a lake and you drop that rock in the water, and the water that's moving away from, that, from where you drop the, the rock in, it ripples and causes that wave to move out, and it hits the standing water in front of it, and it compresses, it causes the wave front, right? And it, because it, it's like slamming into to slow, 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 slow water or no moving water in front of it. Same kind of phenomenon on the freeway, if you happen to live in a busy city like I do. You'd be driving along the 405, very rarely, at, you know, top speed. Yeah, right. <laughs> if, you, if you know anything about Los Angeles freeways, top speed's about 12 miles an hour, I think. Um, but let's pretend for a second that you actually could go fast. And let's say there's a traffic jam in front of you. Well, when you hit that, you know, when you have to slow down and everybody compresses and all the cars get packed in, that compression is the same kind of idea. Um, Everything gets pushed in together. The density of cars increases. Same kind of thing here. You, even though that this space is a vacuum and everything is collisionless, nothing's touching each other, you still can get thing, particles packing in. You can still increase the magnetic field strength and, and boost it and boost everything because you're packing it all in together. And that's what causes the solar storm when, when you talk about fast wind. So again, in my forecasts, what you will see is you will see me talk about, um, well, even in my forecast, this is more like in my daily stuff when, I, when I'm talking to people and we see the, the, the influence of the fast wind or I see the effects of the fast wind are hitting us. I'm not saying the fast wind itself is hitting us. I'm saying this interaction region is hitting us. And that's why we end up getting the big storm up front. And then when we pass through that and now we're in the fast wind stream, you'll hear me say, Okay, now we're in the fast winds, so high latitudes, you guys will probably get aurora for a few more days. Mid latitudes will probably settle down now, or it will take a couple days and then things will settle down. But that's why, is that once you get into the fast wind, well, you don't really get as much intensity of, of, a, of a storming. You can have storming continue, but it typically begins to wane after that. And it's really high latitudes that end up seeing the brunt of that far more than low latitudes because we may drop out of being in a full-blown storm and go more into substorms. But the neat thing about that is that oftentimes that's when you see um, the uh, subauroral phenomenon, you know, st AKA Steve, as, as some people like to call it. Um, and, and so you can, and you get pulsating aurora. The aurora can get very beautiful at, this, at times like these because you're getting now more influences from substorms than you are from a full-blown big storm. But yeah, that's when, you know, aurora photographers at mid-latitudes kind of have to you know, be quiet and, and put their cameras down. But this is also the time when the satellite operators begin biting their nails because this is when the uh, energy in the electron, I mean, radiation belts, especially the outer belt, uh, starts really puffing up and they start getting a lot of anomalies. So um, let, me, uh, let me go back to see whether we have any more questions, but that's pretty much all I wanted to present today. I hope, I hope that has given everybody an idea of, um, I hope that's given everybody an idea of why uh, um, space weather is so radically different during solar maximum compared to solar minimum, and why um, you know why sometimes you can bank on on what space weather effects are going to be, and other times you can't at all, and also what the solar activity cycle really means, and why it's so difficult for us to predict it and why it's so important for, for space scientists and, and solar scientists to predict it now, especially as we go into these lower activity cycles and cosmic ray penetration is really, you know, really becomes an issue for us. So only cosmic rays can explain low sun activity? I'm not really sure I understand that. Um, let's see, okay. Anybody have any more questions? <laughs> I am not going to define gravity. <laughs> was a great stream, Tamitha. Thank you. You're very welcome. I hope um, I will go back and take a look at some of these pictures, some of these these uh, comments, and uh, and see if I can. You know, maybe it'll give me fodder for another another course next month. Um, will you please give a heads up when declining phase? Uh, when is the declining phase? Well, we are we are now at the at the end of the declining phase. We are actually moving into a solar minimum if we aren't already in solar minimum now. Uh, the, the big question becomes what is the ascending phase of the cycle going to look like and when will it happen? There are some people that are saying that you know, we, should, we should already be, as of 
about April of this year, we could have been entering solar minimum. And, and honestly, I, I think April of next year is when we have the, um, at, at NASA, or at NOAA rather, we're going to have the, uh, the, the big uh, solar physics meeting where all of the modelers get together and, are, and will hopefully definitively decide whether or not we have reached solar minimum and what the new cycle is going to look like. Uh, again, it's hard to know with the kind of data that we get. Uh, you see how quickly we make our revisions to the models, uh, to our model predictions. Um, and, and so expect that. But expect that really we're going to end up definitively saying we were in solar minimum only after we're probably already in the ascending phase of the next cycle. But keep an eye open for, for, new, um, for new sunspots. Uh, they will be at high latitudes mainly, and they will have a different polarity. They'll be opposite polarity from what you're used to seeing. So if you see a sunspot in the low latitudes and it has a certain polarity, a certain color, if you're looking at you know black or white, uh, if you're looking at the black and white or red or blue, and um, if you're looking at the color magnetograms, um, then at the high latitudes it's going to look uh, the opposite. So you know for that hemisphere. So keep an eye open for those. I love it when everybody posts them for me. Uh, and, and brings my attention to them if I have not seen them yet. Sometimes I get it wrong and I get slapped and pelted with olives by my science colleagues and my space physics colleagues who let me know that I've gotten Hale's law wrong or Joy's law wrong or all these things. So I will make mistakes and, and you'll have to deal with me for that. Um, but I am learning all the time so I will always try to come back and correct what I've, what I've talked about. So okay. Oh good, I'm so glad you guys found my uh, explanation. Um, uh, understandable. The universe is electric driven. You know, I, I, I kind of, I kind of laugh a little bit when I hear that. It, yeah, okay, fine. The, the universe, it is an electric universe. Sure, as you guys want to call it that. But remember Maxwell's laws, right? You don't see an E without an, without a magnetic field. You don't see an electric field without a magnetic field. You don't see a magnetic field without an electric field. Um, it really depends upon the paradigm you want to think about it. So when I talk about magnetic fields, Electric fields are inherently implied, um, you know. And if I'm talking about particles and how particles are moving, I will often talk about electric fields and potentials. But if I'm talking about magnetic fields, then I'm going to talk about how magnetic fields are, are are being bent and curled and stuff like that. Because when you bend magnetic fields or distort them, then you get forces due to electric fields that are that are induced. So, you know, I, I can't talk about electric fields without talking about magnetic fields, and I can't talk about magnetic fields without talking about electric fields. And so anybody who thinks that a, a physicist, a space weather physicist, is only thinking about magnetic fields and doesn't believe that the universe is electric is, is silly. I've gotten so many people ask me about the solar wind. Well, this is because of the electric fields in the solar wind. Well, yeah, there's an electric field in the solar wind, and it's connected to a magnetic field. And when you look at the two, you get a V cross B drift, and you get you get forces in a certain way, and that's why the wind blows. And okay, great, but they're all connected together. So I hope people will begin to understand that if you just look at Maxwell's laws, which are the laws that govern electromagnetic uh, uh, dynamics, that you're going to see electric fields and magnetic fields are siblings, and they're always being invoked. And physicists who, who, you know, who, who talk about magnetic fields obviously know that electric fields are implied as well. And I just hope that the electric universe folk don't forget about the magnetic fields because that, that's kind of what it seems like. And, and you're really doing yourself a disservice when you do that. So, um, so that's, you know, that's all I have to say about that. Okay. So, okay, great, guys. Yeah, I, I have gotten questions about Birkeland currents. I might go into some of that stuff in another uh, Q&A later on. It depends upon how people want me to talk about the ionosphere. There's a lot of really cool stuff there. Um, and uh, I, I would hope that, that I'd, I'd probably have to talk to Nathaniel Frizzell and maybe get some of the ham sci guys involved. Um, but I'll think about putting together something like that for a future, uh, for a future stream. OK. Um, have we seen a new sun, sunspot from Solar Cycle 25 yet? Yes, we have. We've seen several of them. Um, We've, the first one we saw, I believe, was in December of 2016. It was a long time ago. We saw another definitive one in April of, I think, just this, this year. Uh, there have been a couple others, one or, tw one or two, that, that uh, I've seen documented in certain places, and then other people have said, no, because it violates this law or that law. It's just a rogue sunspot. 
Uh, I got one wrong just recently in a, in a space weather forecast that I did. Uh, I, got, I definitely got pelted with olives on that one. Um, but uh, yeah, they're, they're coming. And they're going to come with more frequency. Because as you saw with the periodicity of the, 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 um, all these pseudo cycles, they overlap. All of this amplitude modulation and stuff means these cycles, one cycle doesn't just stop and another one starts. They overlap. And so you're going to see kind of the fall of one kind of sunspot and the rise of another. And it's, it's, you know, it should be separated by latitude. Uh, that's that's going to be our biggest indicator um, as to which belongs to what. Because as we get closer to solar minimum, you're going to see a, a more rogue sunspots that will have the right polarity for the new cycle, but there would be at low latitudes. And that apparently is still considered a sunspot for the current cycle. So that's one of the mistakes I have made. Um, so just look for the high latitude sunspots that have the different reversal or has a different polarity than what the current sunspots have. And, um, and that should keep you pretty straight. So... Okay, guys, um, thanks so much for all your fantastic questions. As you can tell, I'm hoarse. Um, and, yeah, I see another couple of questions about sunspots. Maybe I'll do, um, I'll think about that as well as maybe having a, a, a stream that's dedicated solely to solar phenomena and talk about more, more about sunspots and talk about prominences and filaments and how these things are, are built and what some of the laws are, how we can tell why things tilt why things go down to lower uh, latitudes as the sunspot cycle progresses. These are all really good solar physics questions. So that, that gives me fodder for yet another, uh, another course. So I appreciate that. Okay. Sunspot max size. Yeah, I'm not going to go into that right now. Um, I might say something that's wrong, and I don't want to do that. So because <laughs> um, I am not sure exactly what the sunspot, the maximum size of a sunspot is. I think there's probably, there is a theoretical limit, but it has a lot to do with the strength of the, of the uh, magnetic field at the source region. And obviously that's going to be solar activity cycle uh, uh, based, uh, not just to the 11 year cycle, but as we've already seen from today's course, the bigger activity cycles that modulate these smaller ones. So, I mean, obviously the maximum sunspot size of a sunspot during the Maunder minimum was nothing, <laughs> right? Because they didn't even exist. So, um, so I'm sure there there are there are other other thresholds that have to be reached as well. Not just the magnetic strength threshold, but there's probably other stability thresholds that I am not completely well versed in. But that may have to do with dynamics of con convection and and um, and cells and stuff like that. So I'll look into that. Okay. You're welcome, you guys. I am. So, I need to be talking about Nibiru. You know, <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> um, yeah, I know. My my voice is horrible. So, okay, guys, I'm going to get off here. As you can tell, I'm very hoarse. This was fantastic. Uh, I hope I was coherent uh, enough to uh, to tell you, you know, to to be to be able to give you a decent um, idea of of uh, of the cycles. But please, please contact me on Twitter or any other place if you have ongoing questions. Or join me on Patreon, um, and uh, and you will get your questions answered first, uh, because my patrons, you guys, are the ones who make all of this possible. And so the more of you that join me in the community, the more things like this I can do. So again, I, I love you guys. Thank you so much, and I will talk to you soon. And I think I will see if I can turn this broadcast off. I'm not exactly sure how to do it. I think I do it like this. Okay? And hopefully you guys like the new the new gear I used. So... We'll do more of these. Okay, guys. Bye.